Welcome to the Ian Bounsfield Experience. I'm glad you're here. This series of podcasts are just things that come up in my mind when I'm thinking about playing, when I'm thinking about teaching, and general thoughts about music. There are some things here that I hope you'll find really useful. And don't forget, if you've got any comments or if there's anything you want to discuss further, go to ianbowsfield.com. So, I, I, hitting on some, some sort of like slightly controversial things, don't want to do it in, 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 in a negative sort of way. Support and diaphragm. Mm -hmm. Another one of those elephants in the room yeah. today in brass pedagogy. Um, where are you on that? Do you see something you could talk about? Sure. I could talk about it with, with great knowledge yeah. because the, the issue here, I mean, there should be no controversy. There's only controversy when you have a conversation among people that don't know what on earth they're talking about. They either don't know how the body functions efficiently yeah. Yeah. or the terminology is, is goofed up right. and they're talking about something that this person is understanding one thing, yeah. this person's understanding yet another, mm -hmm. and now they're confusing mm -hmm. this and they think the other person's an idiot, right? And yeah. granted, the person might be an idiot, but they might be just talking about something else. Yeah. They might not be an idiot. Um, this concept of... of diaphragm i mean the diaphragm if you if you go all the way back to the beginning of what is it and how does it function there's no argument there should be no argument it is just simply a large muscle our largest internal muscle mm -hmm. in fact mm -hmm. and it has one purpose and one purpose only it's the largest internal muscle and its principal job when it flexes like when it gets strong like say if you if you made your, your biceps really strong, mm -hmm. when it does that, it's on the inhalation. Mm -hmm. After that, if you want to exhale, it has no role. None. Yeah. It has no role in blowing. So if someone says, blow from your diaphragm, we already have a problem. Yeah. Because number one, the terminology is just simply false because yeah. you cannot do that. Yes. But if they mean something else, I don't know what it is they yeah. mean. Because you can't do that. Yeah. So now there's a, a there's not only you know a problem semantically, there's now just a communication breakdown, mm -hmm. right? So that's not something that could be argued. What I'm mm -hmm. what I'm talking about at this point, like we're, we're, when we talk about these physiological issues, not one word that I will ever say about this subject is an opinion. No. There no. is no opinion. No. And when people have an opinion about these things, Absolutely. they're already, you could, you could already label them as, um, well, yeah, again, bless their, bless their hearts. Yeah. yeah. But that I heard just yesterday, yeah. somebody said, when someone says bless their heart, what they're really saying is, <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> you might need to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might not. There we go. Um, but this, but so that's one idea or like one, that's not even an idea. That's just the way things are, yeah. right? When it comes to support, now again, if you talk to four people, you probably have four different ideas of what on earth you're talking about. And there is a natural function to how the human body is, is working for moving air either in or out. And I think that when people use this term support mm -hmm. in, in, in the brass playing context, they're normally referring to some type of exhalation, yeah. like blowing with yeah. support. Yeah. But already there's a breakdown in communication because people are thinking different things. Yeah. But you can separate that from this completely wrong-headed idea. And again, this yeah. is not an opinion. This is a fact. This wrong idea that if you stabilize your abdominal region, this will somehow help your playing. I'm feeling uncomfortable just thinking about it, actually. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I saw you touch your abdominals. I was, oh. <laughs> well, as soon as you actually form yeah. that. Rex, uh, he's uh, punching himself in the stomach, now, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So as soon as you actually stabilize your abdominal wall, I mean, you can still play beautifully. It'll be hard. It won't yeah. be efficient. Yeah. It's not the yeah. easiest way to play, but you can still play. I once heard a great tuba player, Sam Palafian, I once heard him play standing on his head yeah. upside down, yeah. and it was beautiful. Yeah. I was going to say, not... you, could probably, you could probably play beautifully with a spike stuck in your leg. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I can demonstrate, I mean, it, 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 
it sounds weird to hear me say it, but if you heard me demonstrate it, you'd understand. I can demonstrate beautiful articulations with my tongue hanging out the side yeah. of my mouth. Yeah. Um, but that's not how I choose to articulate yeah. normally. Yeah. But this strong abdominal wall, it's just limiting now how efficiently you can move air right. in or out of your right. body. Just like someone, uh, you were talking about cricket earlier. Yeah. A batter could play cricket with yes. both arms Completely stiffly flexed. Yeah. Yeah. And the best could probably still manage to get yeah. something done. Yeah. But the best ones would probably never do that no. as a matter of technique. No. Uh, unfortunately, this is a big unfortunately, uh, so you could put that in italics. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. a lot of brass teachers teach the way they were taught. Yes. Instead of teaching by fact or teaching by style or sound or, or good musical intentions. And so it is possible to play well with this strong abdominal wall. Well, teach what they think they're doing. They're not, in many cases, I found, I mean, when I play a top E flat really loud, my abdomen, my abdominals are quite firm. They're, they're working. They're reacting to the resistance in my embouchure, you know. And, well, and what they are doing is compressing yeah. the air the way you would need to play yeah, a high E flat. Exactly, but I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm not, it's well, happening. I'm and, not doing it. And when you stop playing that note, they're not still flexed. No. And while you're playing that note, if you looked in a mirror, it's slowly, as you're running out of air, yep. moving in. Exactly, yeah. But even worse is when a teacher doesn't do that at all, but their teacher told them to. Yes. So they think, well, I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. So I'm teaching the next generation how to do it. Yeah. Um, and so it leads to misunderstandings. It leads to really big inefficiencies in people's playing. Um, and it gives me extra income, helping professionals who <laughs> thought they should have been doing it that way. Yeah. But again, I want to stress the fact that this is not a matter of opinion. No. There's no room, there is no discussion of that as an opinion. No. If you know the actual facts, those yeah. are facts. That's yeah. not something I, I made up. Yeah. Um, it's in that case, uh, the conductor Franz Walter Merst once said to me, there's one golden rule about music. As soon as you will use the word I, you're wrong. And so, you know, if it, it either yeah. is or it isn't, this is this, this is this, and this is this. Yeah. When you start saying, I think, I prefer, yeah. I like, yeah. you're probably wrong, you know? I mean, yeah, otherwise it's just a matter of opinion. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, I, I would say that I prefer to listen um, to Brahms more than Offenbach. Yeah. But sure. somebody yeah. else probably yeah. really likes Offenbach. Yeah. Bless their hearts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah, don't need a, a, a bleeper on that one. Yeah. Um, going back to, um, if you wouldn't mind, Arnold Jacobs. Uh, we had a conversation in your kitchen a couple of days ago, which I found absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't know Arnold Jacobs. Um, but just listening to what you've said about him and also reading the transcripts of... of speeches that he's given or whatever the impression that I got to him of him is quite different to what I think a lot of other people seem to think of him mm -hmm. and you said something the other day about his teaching methods changing and being flexible all of the time yeah. could you go into that yeah um, I first met him it would have been I think 1979 around then 1979 or 1980 um and at that point, you can think about it in two different things going on. Number one, he had his teaching knowledge and teaching techniques and teaching style for mm. right then. Mm. But he also had specifically the teaching method that he would use for me mm -hmm. as a subset of that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. But as he got older, he continued to learn, he continued to refine his teaching, and it got better and better and right. better. And if... And, and I actually had the odd lesson going on all the way until near the end of his life. Right. Um, my very last lesson was the last time I saw him. So it was just a few months before he died. Mm. And, but that was the first lesson I'd had in <clears throat> probably eight or nine years. There'd been a long period where I wasn't taking any lessons at all. Because I had felt that was doing nothing but making me lose my self-confidence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The more I took lessons, the right. more I felt like... Right. 
I needed to check everything yeah. with him before yeah. I could just play it. Yeah. And I thought, okay, this isn't healthy. Yeah. But I did want to play for him one last time. But mainly because he asked me to come in and play. Because he'd been getting reports from all around the world that saying, wow, we heard Rex play. And he's just, he's the greatest ambassador for your way of teaching. When you mm. hear him play, that's... And he got suspicious. Like, okay, I haven't heard Rex for eight years. Like, what on earth is he doing if people are... Yeah or attributing it to me. So he yeah. asked me to come and play. And so mm -hmm. I had that last lesson. And it, it was really nice. And for me, it was a bit like closing the book. And mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. both felt really good about it. It yeah, was yeah. really nice by yeah. the end. But hearing him talk about his own teaching from 20 years before I met him, right. or 30 years before I met him, yeah. he criticized his own teaching and mm -hmm. said, I was not a good teacher. Mm -hmm. He had a fascination with all things physical. And mm -hmm. at one point, he wanted to leave the orchestra and become a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. His father had wanted to be a medical doctor, had studied in medical school, mm -hmm. but had to leave school to come back and support the family mm -hmm. during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And Jake had that same desire. And I don't know if it was wanting to complete what his father hadn't been able to complete or just his own love of the subject. Mm -hmm. But he then started studying to gain entrance to medical school and then started to teach his tuba students with this new information he was getting, thinking, you know, if you could learn all the, the function of the human body, it could only help your mm -hmm. playing, mm -hmm. until he realized he was tying them in knots. Right. And the more they thought right. about that, the yeah. worse they were getting. Yeah. And there's an anecdote that <clears throat> he never told, but... I will say there was a comedian or a, two brothers that were a comedy team, very popular in the 1960s, and I think they're both still alive, called the Smothers Brothers. Okay. So you should find them okay. later on, and they were very, very clever. Yeah. Um, and one was a straight man and one was the idiot, yeah. but they're yeah. both really smart, right? Yeah, yeah, and they're both yeah. musicians, played okay. bass and guitar. But Tommy Smothers, I think it was Tommy, um the dumb one, the blonde one, uh, loved golfing. And because of his privileged position as a famous man and a wealthy man, he could then go take lessons, of golf lessons, with all the famous golfers of the world. So he had golf lessons with Tiger Woods and golf lessons with Jack Nicklaus and uh, golf lessons with... I don't know, I'm not a golfer, so all these no. names don't come right to mind. Yeah, you said Jack Nicholas, I thought. No, wasn't he in The Shining? I thought, no, that's no, Jack Nicholas. Jack Nicholson. <laughs> uh, uh, Jack Nicholas is the closest person I've ever found to Adolf Herseth, by the way, wow. in terms of the way he thinks the and the way he did things. Wow. Yeah, those two were cut from the same cloth. Arnold Palmer, all these other great mm. names. Anyway, mm. he had lessons with all the greats. And because he was in this privileged position of being perhaps the only person that's ever taken lessons with all of these people, mm. he said he was going to write a book. And this book was to be called The 20 Most Important Things to Think About at the Moment of Impact. <laughs> <laughs> and that's... I tell that story because that's kind of what was happening to Jake's students mm -hmm. who studied with him in the mm -hmm. 1950s. Right. And then the story I mentioned to you a few days ago, I heard this from Will Scarlett, who later was the first trumpet player in, in our brass quintet and a longtime third trumpet player in the Chicago mm -hmm. Symphony and uh, a great uh, lover of Arnold Jacobs mm -hmm. and a huge supporter of, of Bud Herseth. Um, but he told the story that once in the 1950s, walking up to the stage at Orchestra Hall, Arnold Jacobs went up to Bud, and they were friends. They were buddies. They played in their own brass quintet. And Jake just wanted to know, he said. And, and Adolf Herseth, his nickname was Bud, so everybody called him Bud. In fact, I'll tell you, when I was a child, because I was a, one in a family of or six children, I think my dad probably never remembered all of our names to keep us all separated so my nickname was bud i was always okay. bud bud do this bud do that bud yeah. where where are you yeah. um bud come work all these things but when i moved to chicago i quickly found that nickname had been taken yes <laughs> <laughs> and i haven't been called bud for 40 years <laughs> anyway so mr jacobs was walking up the steps and talking to to mr herseth and he said bud tell me what is it you think about while you're playing the trumpet 
And Bud looked at him like, I don't know what you're asking, but I just think about how it goes. And they kept walking a couple more steps. And Jake said, yeah, but <clears throat> I understand that. But like right in that, that moment when you put the trumpet up to your lips to play, what, it, what is it you're thinking about? He says, well, Jake, I just think about how it goes. Took another step. Yeah, but like right then, you've just taken your breath. You just pressed down the valve. You're about to play. Now, what are you thinking about? And he said, damn it, Jake. I think about how it goes. Yep. And Jake went back downstairs and wrote that down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and at that moment, and he told he didn't tell me that story, but he he told me that about that time, he realized his mistake in trying to teach the physical aspects of yeah. the playing, that what he really needed to study was the psychological aspects of playing, mm -hmm. of how do you use your thoughts to control your body, mm -hmm. and that's what he became very, very clever at mm. doing the mm. rest of his career. He was already expert at it when I was studying with him, mm. but I think became even better the next 20 years right. before he died. Right. And so good, but he still had this love of the physical side of things. And so he would still sometimes, in my opinion, over-teach that. Yeah. And kind of go a little too far. I remember a, a dear friend of mine, a horn player I went to school with, he wasn't the smartest guy, but he was a great, great horn player. Great, And like Dennis Brain, was also a, a, an organist. Okay. Um, and he went to an Arnold Jacobs master class, this audience. It was at this big convention, so there was probably an audience of over a thousand people that came to hear Jake talk. And my buddy, the one that's not so smart, <laughs> he said, you know, he talked for about breathing for an hour. And at the end... He told this guy, play, but just don't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject of breathing, there, there are a couple of quotes that, are, that I've seen. Um, one is an Arnold J. If, if I go and do a master class and I say, whose teaching school would you most associate with breathing? And I had uh, Arnold Jacobs, Arnold Jacobs. And then I say, can I give you a quote? I'm not big on breathing. I just believe in sucking air through my lips. Who said that? And then it goes quiet and people go, uh, Arnold Jacobs? I said, right. Mm -hmm. Can you shed some light on that? Yeah. On those? I, I will, with another little story. Yeah. I'd had probably four or five lessons with him at, at this point. Was already substituting in the Chicago Symphony for him. And I was like his baby, his mm -hmm. star. Um, and at one point in a lesson, I just said, well, Mr. Jacobs, shouldn't we be working on my breathing? And, and, he, and he looked at me <laughs> <laughs> with this look like I had, like I was from Mars or like I had two heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With this quiz look. He said, well, why on earth should we talk about your breathing? I said, well, because you're the world's foremost authority on this subject. I right. thought maybe we should be addressing this. And he said, well, perhaps I could. And I won't even imitate him because he yeah. had a beautiful speaking voice. And yeah. I don't want to be thought yeah. of as, as ridiculing it. But he had a gorgeous speaking voice. And he said, well, we, I could probably show you one or two things that might make you know, a matter of efficiency. But all it would do is make you think about it and become self-conscious. So we're not going to do that. Right. Yeah. And we never did talk about yeah. breathing. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. But I learned a lot about breathing by watching him teach others. Right. And I prob I don't want to come across as someone whose ego wouldn't even fit through that door, but I probably know more about this subject than anyone else I've met. Mm -hmm. um, and if you talk to my students, they'd say, I don't talk about it very much. Right. But we work on it a lot. Mm-hmm. But I do it very differently than Mr. Jacobs. I generally will not use what I call his toys. I don't... <laughs> A little distraction. <laughs> um, I don't, won't usually use his toys unless I need to. And I can use them effectively if I'm perhaps only seeing someone once. Um, but I've found that given enough time, I can help someone 
get to the same place without using those, and then they no longer then would have the potential issue of feeling dependent on these. I've known professional brass players, professionals on stage with their orchestra with a little plastic breathing yeah. toy, yeah. thinking they've got to have their hit yeah. before they can play. Yeah. And that's just unacceptable, yeah. completely unacceptable. No, absolutely. So, absolutely. But I do work on breathing quite a bit, but it's at a level of simplicity that anyone could do. Yeah. And they can do it first time every time, yeah. and they don't think there's anything special about it because we're all able to do these things. Yeah. And if someone's never had any, any instruction whatsoever on breathing, I usually don't have to help them at all. Does it frustrate you sometimes that um, Arnold Jacobs was visited by many professional players who were struggling and um, finding things difficult, and he performed brass playing emergency medicine upon them to try and get their playing somehow back mm -hmm. on the straight and narrow. Ultimately, he didn't work out and they finished up teaching and then they were teaching emergency medicine on healthy... Yeah. Did you, do you know of many instances of that? I know several. some teachers who do that. Yeah, I know several. Yeah. Unfortunately, I know several. Yeah. If, you, if you could analyze the group of students who studied with Arnold Jacobs, you'll find that it falls into two or maybe three groups. The largest in terms of numbers and in terms of time was a tiny group of people who just happened to be from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so he was a local teacher most of his life. Mm -hmm. He was toiling away. He became famous as a great player long before anybody mm -hmm. knew of him as a teacher. Yeah. Um, but he'd been teaching right from the get-go. But only people right there in Chicago. So the world didn't really know about very many of them because most of them, like any subset coming from one town, didn't make it professionally. Yeah. The next set would have been, again, relatively small, would be students like me that moved there specifically to study with him. Mm -hmm. And of that group, some people understood his teaching well, uh, most did not, because mm -hmm. most only understood it from the perspective that they needed. Mm -hmm. And they were being taught to be players, not being taught to be teachers. Mm -hmm. And then the last group is the one that you're mentioning. That's more people who they waited a long time, perhaps, yeah, too, long perhaps too long, before yeah. they came. Mm -hmm. And I would, I, would, I would change one word in the description. I wouldn't say he tried to help them. He did help right. them. Yeah. There was not one time that he would try anything. Mm -hmm. There was no try. There, mm -hmm. this, was, this is what you do. This is what you do. Yeah. He would often spell out exactly, this is what you have to practice. This is what you have to think about. Do that. Mm -hmm. And they'd suddenly be able to play well right, right there in his room yeah. and go home and go right back to what they'd always been yeah. doing. Mm -hmm. um, but it helped them for that hour, yeah. right, or for however many lessons they had. Yeah. And, and that for them was like magic. And they realized, okay, if that helped me, this is going to help everybody. And now they're doing things to students. Yes. That, and giving them information mm -hmm. that perhaps they would be better off not having. Yeah. And I'm not one that would ever advocate uh, keeping people in the dark about helpful information. No. It's just that if there's a ballet dancer that doesn't have a torn ligament, don't yeah. don't talk about torn ligaments with somebody that doesn't yeah. need it. Yeah. You know, so they don't have to put a splint on to yeah. go dance. Yeah. Um, just teach them healthy ways of practicing and healthy ways of doing their routines so that they're not going to be damaged, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That would be the way he would teach his long-term students. Mm -hmm. But when someone comes with an injury, be it physical or mental, he would help them. Mm -hmm. But then they would often then teach, again, like a lot of people, they would teach the way they were taught when they go back. Yeah. And I feel, yeah... I feel he's been misrepresented mm -hmm. by uh, perhaps the great majority of people that I've talked to or read their comments about him. Mm -hmm. I've vastly misunderstood about mm -hmm. many, many things. Mm -hmm. But most people didn't study with him to be teachers. He was helping them to be the best player that mm -hmm. he could right yeah. then. Yeah. Um, I think I might be certainly one of the very few that studied with him that didn't ever have any problems. I never had the kind mm -hmm. of typical mm -hmm. problems people would go yeah. to him for. 
And I'm one of the few that really played well. I mean, mm. there, yeah. he didn't get to work with very many excellent players. Mm. You know, he worked with a lot of people in trauma, psychological yeah. and physical trauma or yeah. professional trauma. And he worked with this set of kind of just normal students that would mm. come. And, yeah. and he did get to work with some of his colleagues. And mm -hmm. I think most of them, I'd say all of them were, were thrilled right. that they played better yeah. and more efficiently yeah. with some of the knowledge that he helped yeah. them with. You but say, my, let me interrupt no, no, one, one, one little bit. Um, my teacher, Arnold Jacobs, is really different than other people's teachers, right. Arnold Jacobs. Yeah. Um, when I think of him, it's not just this kind grandfather saying, you know, song and wind and things like this. For me, it's this guy saying, play it again. Play it again. It can be better. Play it again. Yeah. Perhaps one phrase for 45 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. That was all, for me, what he gave me more than anything else. Well, two things above all else. One is my sound, mm -hmm. which I'm now a museum piece of his sound, mm -hmm. and which I think is just the best sound, that mm -hmm. he had the most beautiful sound. Yeah. And then the other one was a love of impossibly high standards. Mm -hmm. Impossibly high standards. You, you got that from him? Yep. Wow. I certainly didn't get it from Ed Livingston. <laughs> Ed gave me a love of, of just enjoying playing, yeah. <laughs> which is a wonderful gift. And I didn't get that from Jake. From Jake, I got the love of playing the tiniest little detail better than it's maybe ever been played. That's very interesting. I wanted to talk to you about that because it's something, I mean... I'm the same. I'm not quite sure where I got that from, but it's the same that you and I don't drink a glass of wine. We don't <laughs> eat. There might be several. Is that what you mean? Well, that's well, that's for sure. But but it's it's this wine from yeah. this producer yeah. in this year. Yeah. It's the obsession of quality, no matter yeah. what. I mean, look at the watches that you wear. Look at the bike that's next to you there. You know yeah. this yeah. obsession with quality and perfection. Tran yeah. Is it, did it transfer from Arnold Jacobs into the rest of your life, or do you think you were a willing victim? Um, I've had that, um, that side of my personality. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think of it as a character flaw. No, but Others not. Might, might think of it as being obsessive-compulsive. But I think anybody that labels anybody obsessive-compulsive probably doesn't have a love of excellence. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't know anybody that's ever touched excellence yeah. that doesn't have that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and when I'm talking excellence, I'm probably using that in a word that not, not everyone would understand. Mm -hmm. I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of you. I'm thinking of Adolf Herseth. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of George Vosburgh. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a very, very small group of people mm. that have mm. done things on brass instruments with excellence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason why people people want want to or keep going back to recordings of Glenn Gould. Right. They're excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have half the character flaws he had. <laughs> <laughs> but I had that before I became really good playing an instrument. Mm. Uh, my first obsession oh, okay. that I can remember was as a Maybe a 10 or 11, 12-year-old child became obsessed with stereos and electronics mm -hmm. and building mm -hmm. amplifiers and speakers. And I thought, actually, I would like to become either an electronics engineer mm -hmm. or a sound engineer. And I thought a recording engineer, something like that. Mm -hmm. I thought that's where I would end up going. Mm -hmm. um, so I already had that. And mm -hmm. I became obsessed with stereos until I finally... And now I'm living in Switzerland and in an apartment. I no longer have a, a nice stereo here, really. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I stopped when I became satisfied that for a given amount of money, this was the best stereo that yeah. I could. And I loved it. I yeah. loved listening to records. I loved listening to music on yeah. that specific stereo. Yeah. But so that helped. And then uh, I was certainly a willing character 
to try to work towards excellence for Mr. Jacobs. Mm -hmm. And then my best friend in Chicago was George Vosberg, who has exactly the same personality that you and I have. <laughs> and yeah. he had an obsession with quality and excellence as well. Yeah. And, and it sort of bleeds into everything. And mostly I think of that as a real positive. Mm -hmm. But there are obviously some negative sides to it. Yeah. I found the biggest negative was expecting everybody to want that mm -hmm. in everything. Mm -hmm. um, and not everybody needs that. Not everybody mm -hmm. desires that. Yeah. There's a quote from one of my favorite musicians, uh, cert certainly not a classical musician, but his name is Tom Waits. And he's an artist, a real artist with words and an artist with music, um, a terrible voice, maybe the worst voice you'll ever hear. But he has a quote that I think is quite clever. And he said, the way we do anything is the way we do everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, fantastic. And I think you're like that, and I'm yeah, like that. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, he does have his disadvantages. Like, I mean, I find this obsessive compulsive thing, the number of musicians or good musicians who have it, is it chicken or egg? I mean, when I practice Brahms 1, I don't just play Brahms 1 and say, okay, there, well, that's good. It's like, well, do it again yeah. and again check it check it and then it did yeah. then i realized like i have to check whether i've locked my car 25 times so it yeah. just has some disadvantages <laughs> you you say that um arnold jacobs teaching evolved yeah. over his life as a teacher yeah has yours and if so how oh mine's mine's evolved dramatically because right. well backing up i never had any interest in being a teacher i was a hundred percent a player and really just a player you know yeah. that's all i wanted yeah. to do in most of my upbringing i hadn't had good teaching mm -hmm. i had i had a couple of excellent band directors and a, a strangely an excellent typing teacher in high okay. school and a few odd teachers here and there but in my village i think yeah. they didn't have the greatest teachers in the world but then i would say ed livingston was a great teacher arnold jacobs was a great teacher, yeah. the greatest teacher of any subject I've ever yeah. known. Sorry again for the bad language, but there's no way I could italicize great, curvy enough to emphasize that. Um, a wonderful, wonderful teacher. But I didn't want to even do that. I had no interest. Yeah. Um, and then at one point, it happens to any good player, if you're a good player, somebody's going to want to study with you. Yeah. And I was hired to be a tuba professor at DePaul University in Chicago when I was 23. Right. And I thought, yeah, why not? Yeah. I show up for my very first lesson. There's a guy four years older than me. I'd never met him. He sits down, he plays. He finished playing. I said, that sounds fine. What else have you got? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, well, my other teacher would criticize it and kind of break it apart, then we'd do it again. And I said, well, but it sounds fine. Yeah. What do you want to do? Play it again until you mess it up? It's like, you know, <laughs> I, I only thought like a player, right? Yeah. And But we have an hour to kill. Um, and so I thought, well, would you like me to play it for you? And I didn't know it was an etude I'd never seen, but I, I was a good reader. So I picked up my tuba. I played it for him. He played it better than he did. And I said, no, you play it. He played it, and he sounded better than before. So I thought, okay. Remember that. <laughs> Remember that technique. And now 40 years later, it's still been that progression of what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. And I would say certainly, well, that was a terrible lesson. That, that was, I'm sure that wasn't uh, a positive experience for him or for me. Um, but looking back, since the time I became serious about teaching, which was mm. shortly after that, mm. that's when I started going to watch other people's lessons with Arnold Jacobs and attending his... Every summer he gave a week of master classes at Northwestern that I, I would attend. And then I eventually was hired as the professor at Northwestern in 1988. And by then I'd already committed a lot to this mm. is what I am. But at that yeah. point I was still playing over a thousand dienst every year mm -hmm. and trying to balance a full-time teaching job and a thousand services. Um, so I was a busy guy, but I really wanted to be good at this. So I, I've been getting better and better. But I would say since that time, there are two lessons, two very specific lessons that I can remember that wasn't very successful. Mm. 
This yeah. guy did not play better at the end than he did when he walked in the door. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that there has to be thousands. I don't know how many lessons mm -hmm. I've taught, but thousands since then. Two of them were not a success. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. both of them, on reflection, I realized what I could have done better. Yeah. So I've learned from them. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, first of all, that's an astonishing um, track record. Uh, <laughs> speaking as another teacher. <laughs> well, you uh, know, I, I've, I really took it seriously. Yeah. And, and, and I realized that very, very, I'd say nearly all of what we do comes down to such simple things. The actual care of what we do is so small that mm -hmm. it all comes down to just a few things. Right. And it's like a distillation process, isn't yep. it? Yep. And I have that knowledge. Yes. I also have, I think, I mean, there are some things that I have that I've developed, that I've, that I've improved, but there's also some gifts that I just have. I have mm -hmm. a very strong sense of empathy, as you do. Mm -hmm. So when someone's next to me, I know what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. and, and as a player and as a teacher, I know what they're thinking. Yeah. They better be careful right. what they're thinking about because yeah, I can clearly can read, read their mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and that used to astonish me when I would watch Arnold Jacobs and he'd say something was this what you were thinking about? And it was always correct. Mm -hmm. I don't ask my students questions like that because it's clear what they're thinking about. Yeah. And I, I subtly try to get them to where they're yeah. thinking about something that's going to help them play better. But I have that as kind of a gift, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. um, I have developed, I think, you know, I'm not entirely sure, but I think I've developed pretty good communication styles and I can mm. teach in a few languages. So mm -hmm. that helps. And learning to teach in German and, and in Italian has also helped my teaching in English mm -hmm. quite a bit. And I'll tell you another story that was quite educational for me. I was teaching a master class in Tuscany about 15 years ago. And uh, a student who had studied with me both in Chicago and quite a bit in Italy, an Italian horn player mm -hmm. who speaks English beautifully, far better than I speak Italian, he was watching me teach other people in Italian. It was the first time that he'd seen me teach in Italian since I'd learned Italian. And uh, when it came time for his lesson, he said, Rex, would you please also teach me in Italian? And I said, Andrea, what? why would you want me to teach you in Italian when your English is so much better? He says, because you're so much nicer in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and I called Margaret, my wife, that night, because I was distraught. Yeah. I really was distraught. I said, Margaret, this is what happened today. And she said, well, yes, that's true. You're much nicer in Italian, and you're even nicer in German. And like, who says that? <laughs> yeah, right. But, no, that is interesting. I mean, my best friend in the Vienna Philharmonic, a violinist, he has mother tongue English and German. He's yeah. a much nicer guy in English. Yeah. I mean, noticeably. Yeah, but I think, and Margaret and I talked about this, I think the reason I'm nicer in these other languages is I don't have enough command over those languages to be sarcastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I have quite a love of sarcasm. Yeah. And I read a quote last year that said, basically nobody likes sarcasm, but I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Rex. Shall we wind this up? Is there anything you'd like to... Do you think that you'd really like people to know about you or music? You... you know, I wrote a few things down mm. just to prepare Please. for this. And there are a few things that are kind of dear to me yeah. um, that we've not covered. Much yeah. of what I wrote down we've already, already covered. Um, and one of those would be uh, a, a saying that I like to use that I came up with talking with Arnold Jacobs and what we haven't talked about the elephant in the room is where does all of Arnold Jacobs philosophies come from mm -hmm. and that all all I would I would say close to at least 100% of everything he ever wanted anybody to do was to try to get them to play like Adolf Herseth <laughs> it all came from Herseth, that yeah. standard. Yeah. Um, and so Jake and I were, uh, I usually 
trying to think of him as Mr. Jacobs, but yeah. his nickname was Jake. Yeah. At the end of our of his life and of our relationship, he said, well, Rex, well, please call me Arnold. And <laughs> I tried a few times, and it <laughs> felt so uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I just, just like with uh, Ed Kleinhammer, he insisted the day I met him that I call him Ed. And I told him, look, I can't. I can't. Yeah. He says, well, you're going to have to. He said, yeah. Mr. Kleinhammer was my father. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Ed. <laughs> um, but anyway, I was talking with Mr. Jacobs about why is it that Herseth is just so much better than everybody else? Mm. Why is it? And he had some ideas, and then I gave my ideas. And he thought, hmm. There's something to that. And so we started talking about it. And at that, and I've since changed my way of thinking about it. But I said I thought it came down to, number one, a rather off-the-charts sensitivity as a human being. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's not common, no. but it's not unheard of. Yeah, yeah. But there are some great brass players that share this, a a really almost debilitating sense of sensitivity. And he had that. He had a great ability to communicate and to show off. Mm -hmm. And he had a horse's work ethic when it came to just working and doing the work. He he was a great practicer from beginning till end. But number four, and this is the word I used to use and I don't use it anymore. He had the greatest concentration and focus of anyone I've ever met. Wow. I would say my level of focus is near the 99th percentile of the people I've worked with, Mm -hmm. and he made me look like like a scatterbrained little kid in comparison. And I'm like second or third best of all the people I've ever known, and he was far, far beyond, far beyond what I can even comprehend. And I mentioned that, and Jake said... I never thought of it that way, but you're certainly right. But mm-hmm. then I've changed that. Mm-hmm. Because just like almost every teacher, will, and I've we've had this conversation before, Ian, but mm-hmm. almost every teacher at some point will say to their student, okay, play this again, but concentrate. Yeah. And that's about as nonsensical a statement yeah. as one could say. Yeah. Because you cannot concentrate on concentration no. and expect to do anything differently. No. It's like a dog chasing its tail. Yeah. So now I think of it differently. Concentration is a byproduct of the will. Mm-hmm. And the will, I have a will that's got me into trouble my whole life. Mm-hmm. But Herseth's will was much stronger than mine. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Geyer, who used to play second trumpet in the Chicago Symphony and used to teach trumpet for a short time at Northwestern, um, he sat next to Herseth for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And somebody at a master class once asked Charlie, he said, Charlie, can you talk a little bit about concentration? And Charlie didn't have a great relationship with Herseth near the end. Mm -hmm. And you could see him starting to become a little uncomfortable yeah, yeah. <laughs> after years of therapy trying to deal with this <laughs> relationship because Herseth was a force of will like, right. like nobody I've ever known. He said, let me tell you about concentration. Concentration is a locomotive going down the rails at high speed. It can't turn left. It can't yeah. turn right. It can't easily slow down. Even if a school bus crosses its tracks, yeah. it's going to hit it. Yeah. He said, I sat, he said, let me tell you about concentration. I sat next to it for 12 years. Yeah. He said, I'm pretty sure that if Herseth was playing the opening of Parsifal and somebody fired a pistol right behind yeah. his head, yeah. Herseth would have thought, I'll deal with him later. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm. I have a feeling that's probably what would happen. I played, sadly, um, when Frank, Frank Chrysofoli died, his, his wife assembled a brass quintet of his favorite five players. So mm. we had, a, and I was lucky to be asked to play the, the tuba because um, Arnold Jacobs had died a month earlier. <laughs> Otherwise, they probably would have asked him. Yeah. Um, and Herseth was playing first trumpet. And when we played, 
I, I hesitate to call it a concert because it was a funeral. But when we yeah. went to play the, <laughs> went to play, we were doing the the canzone per sonore, uh, number two of of Gabriele. Mm -hmm. Bom 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 ba da 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 da. You know, we'd all played it together a million times, and Herseth is playing that, and in the middle of that first solo, one of his valve sticks, and it starts off with this like typical Herseth glorious big fat sound. Bom 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 ba. Every note, pure, yeah. absolutely perfectly in tune. Yeah. Never stop, just, God damn it, get that valve yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. Right? And, but still sending everything in. Played the right notes with the wrong valve down. Yep. Yep. I saw more, I told you, I saw Morris Murphy yep. do that several times. Yep. Just the sound, so like, and yep. you look, you've got the wrong finger down. You know? yep. The willpower will do yeah. powerful things. So yeah. that's the one thing I would say. You know, the, there's a, you know, the difference between the greatest players in the world and the really good players is mostly a collection of little details. Yeah. A lot, hundred little details. But the big difference is the greatest players in the world, they can choose to think about whatever they want to think yeah. about in that moment. Yeah. And Herseth had that better than anybody I know. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And that's what Jake was wanting everybody to do. Right. That's where it all comes from. Think about, yeah. Do yeah. this. That. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When it comes time to do it, that's what, that's you, what do. you do. Yeah, absolutely. And Jake had a nice way of dealing with that. He said, look, um, when you're under pressure or if you're in some kind of a crisis, your brain will not want to do that. Yeah. But you must. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as you know that, you yeah. realize, yeah, I don't want to do this, yeah. but... I must. I must. And really then it works. Yeah. Good. Rex, thank you for the last hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> thank you for everything that you have brought to so many students over your life. Thank you for everything that you have brought into my life. I am incredibly grateful and to all of those, from all of those people listening to this, it's been amazing. Thank you very, very much indeed. Oh, thank you, Ian. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. If there are any issues that you found particularly interesting, don't forget to contact me and always go to uh, ianbowsfield.com for lots more interesting stuff. <laughs> <laughs>